Good morning. I hope you don't feel lonely. That's a lousy feeling to feel lonely. And uh, you know, I know that there's a there's a real benefit, a real blessing sometimes to get with a bunch of folks that are all excited about the same thing, whether it's a, a football game or or cheap. And one of the great blessings I used to have when I was, yes, I was a kid at one time. When I was a kid, going to Calvary Chapel in Costa Mesa, just to be in a place where so many people were singing and it was just so beautiful and so wonderful. Um, I can't do the things I used to do when I was a kid anymore. Um, <laughs> but I can remember them. They were wonderful. But you know, every day is wonderful. It's wonderful to be with all of you here today. And you know, if ever you feel like you're alone, you're, you're not. You're not, you're not, you're not alone. That's what we're going to look at today as we look at John chapter 16. I'm not alone. And this is a song of David from Psalm 63. He felt pretty alone, I think, when he wrote Psalm 63. So I'll just remind you of what was said. You can look at Psalm 63 if you want to. Thinking in the shadow And watching through the night Yeah, that's it. 
We have a multi-talented sister here at work with us this morning. She not only wears a red Operation Christmas Child sweater smartly and well, she does camera, she climbs steps. She climbs she, steps. I know she, not she, what she does, but she gives more announcements. Here's Vicki. She's, she's not good at the step climbing part, <laughs> but I'm still doing it. Um, this, I'm wearing this sweater just to remind you all plenty, I mean all our shoeboxes are obviously gone. They've gone to the collection center um, at the New Covenant Church and tomorrow is the last day to get your shoebox in. If you're planning to pack a box this year, that's where it needs to go by tomorrow sometime to get on the track to go to the processing center. Um, hopefully you'll all make it out there. I don't know exactly where New Covenant is, it's on Nice someplace and it's a very big church, it'd be hard to miss. Uh, also, I have two other announcements for things that are going to be happening here on this campus. And we've been invited by our brothers and sisters over there in the gym to join with them on December 19th for a Christmas service. They want, they, they do things a little different than we do, but they're a lot of fun. And they, they said if anybody has a um, special song or a performance they would like to contribute to that service that please let Donise know who Donise is the girl that usually runs the cafe every Sunday so if that's something you'd be interested in they would love to have your input for that otherwise you're just we're just invited to join with them for that service 
And that, again, is Sunday, December 19th at 10.30 in the morning. And then also the Wednesday prior to Christmas, which is December 22nd, there's going to be um, courtyard caroling and cookies and hot cocoa, um, and you're welcome to invite and bring anybody you'd like to that service and to that time of caroling. It'll be at 7 in the courtyard, and we'll be singing Christmas carols together and having them um, cocoa and, and just enjoying one another's company. So hope you can make it. Uh, I think that's everything, everything. Again, that's Wednesday the 22nd, the Wednesday before Christmas. All right, thanks. Go! That was your husband that got that great round of applause going, because he's your number one fan, as it should be. Isn't it, isn't it great? How precious our lives are. I hope you know that. How precious our Jesus, our life, our Jesus, our life. How precious. Wow. If you open your Bibles along with me to John chapter 16. We read last week, let's read it again, starting with verse, oh, let's, let's start, 16, 16. Jesus said, a little while and you will no longer behold me. And again, a little while and you will see me. And some of his disciples therefore said to one another, what is this thing he's telling us? A little while and you will not behold me. And then again, a little while and you will see me. And because I go to the Father. And so they were saying, what is this that he says, a little while? We don't know what he's talking about. Now Jesus knew that they had wished to question him, and he said to them, are you discussing with each other about this, that I said a little while and you will not behold me, and again, a little while and you'll see me? Truly, truly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. Whenever a woman is in labor, whenever she's in travail, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she gives birth to the child, she remembers that anguish no more for the joy that a child has been born into the world. Therefore, you too now have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and no one takes your joy away from you. With the travail of Jesus, with the sufferings that he's about to suffer, it marks the rebirth of humanity. There was the, 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 the first Adam, the first man. Here now we have the second man, the last Adam. And through his travail, through that labor, it's actually the birth of all of us. We're all born again through his travail, through his suffering. What comes forth at the time of the resurrection, when he appears again, it's not just a personal victory. You know, up to then, you know, with the incarnation, with what happened at Bethlehem, God is with us. A miracle of miracles. And yet, when people wanted to see him, especially when the Gentiles wanted to see, he said, unless the grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, he's all alone. He remains by himself all alone, but if he falls into the ground and dies, then when he comes back, then there's harvest and it goes on and on and on. A, a whole new work that begins through the travail and the suffering that's about to take place. Prior to this, he was alone. He was perfect, but perfectly alone. But now, humanity is to be reborn through his suffering. And when he comes back, when he announces his victory, back, uh, just jumping ahead a bit, when he meets with Mary Magdalene there in the garden, his message wasn't, hey, I have had victory, I've overcome. Um, it was, I've done something for everybody. And the way he put it to her is, stop clinging to me, for I've not yet ascended to the Father. But, I, but go to my brethren. He now calls them for the first time. These are my brethren. Go, go to my brothers. Go to my family, go to my brothers and sisters, and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And so in what he did, he did for everybody, and humanity was born again. To Nicodemus, you must be born again. Well, how? Humanity was born again in what Jesus did for everyone. 
But of course, to enjoy it on an individual, on a personal level, you have to believe. That's all. Just believe it. You know, something could be set before you. Who knows what good things might be set before you with the Thanksgiving table coming up. But no matter how great the feast, no matter how perfectly prepared all the food, if you don't believe it, I mean, you believe it enough to sit down and taste and see and start to enjoy, you won't enjoy it. It doesn't matter how much you have, doesn't matter what's set before you. If you don't believe it, if you're not willing to just take it in, then it's still yours, but you don't enjoy it. You can't enter into it. It doesn't enter into you. And so the necessity for faith, so what Jesus did, he did for all. Joy has been born into the world, he says, through the travail that he's about to suffer. Joy has been born into this world. Humanity has been reborn. And nobody can take that away from you. Nobody can undo that. Nobody can take that joy away. A new birth. It's often been said, and when I try to, I try to once in a while attribute a quote to someone, but sometimes I look online and it's like, oh, I just get more confused. I can just say a lot of people have said it. And they've said it in different ways, but it's the, the, the phrase that says that with the birth of every child, whenever a child is born, the world begins anew. And certainly from the perspective of that babe, that child, who cares about history? They'll have to learn that enough later on, and they'll have to live it enough later on. But with the birth of every child, it's the world. It's the whole world. Okay, that's them. That's the baby. Poor kid. No. So much, so, so precious that life. That's why we care for those little ones that can't care for themselves, so precious. And though the whole world begins anew with the birth of every child, you can personally enter into it if you want to. What you do is you hang out with the child. You spend time with the child. You realize that the whole world is opening up to you and I just wanna sit with you and, and be a part of that opening world. That's been one of the greatest pleasures I've had as, as a grandfather. Uh, I was too busy. You know, you just, you gotta, you gotta get by. You gotta do what you gotta do. So, so much more busy with my kids, but with my grandkids, I have the time. And I think anyone who has babies around them, there are an awful lot of unwanted kids. There are an awful lot of folks. You don't have to necessarily adopt them, but you can adopt them into your heart and life. And, if you want to. Now some folks are like, yeah, I don't really like kids. Okay, I understand. Me, I, I love, the, the best way that I can enter into a time portal, I can go back and be a kid again, is just to hang out with kids. And to say, everything's new, everything's fresh. You've never seen this movie, you've never been to this place, you've never known this fact. You've never, you know, the other day I was showing the, the, the kids, you know, you, you do this, you do like that, that. Is that tricky or what? Where did that one begin? I think I saw it on a Laurel and Hardy thing years ago. And in our family, we've done, I showed my grandkids that the other day and, and they were just like, it's, it's a whole new world. You know, and they're just constantly doing that and they're doing all these little, you know, just fun little things, you know, here's the church and here's the steeple, open the door and see all the people. It, isn't, isn't it wonderful? Magic, magic. But that's how it can be true for a, for a little kid, you know. I, one of our neighbors, they, they became grandparents for the first time, and they're older than I am, and they weren't really sure that they wanted a, a grandkids. They didn't think they were going to, and then they, they had their first grandbaby, and they're just, for them, they're experiencing something. But I'll tell you, when they wheel that baby in the stroller, you know, kind of a hand-me-down stroller from our family, they're now enjoying it. And that baby came by the other day, and I was just, I was lost to the baby. I got her out, and, and she's gone through all kinds of terrible, health troubles and things and oh my goodness but how precious that little that little miracle baby is and just to sit there and hold her and and ah oh, okay that's 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 why i've often thought I, i'll go work in children's ministry someone else stand up here and um but what's true of, of an individual child in a troubled world yeah you're gonna have troubles yeah you're gonna find out that there's all kinds of you have to deal with a ton of hassles as you go forward in this world but you know what? I want to be a part of that. I, I, I want to, we're here to help one another. If, if, if you choose, if you, if you can, if you want to do that with an individual baby, how much more so with that new birth that began through what Jesus did? That new birth is something that can be completely a part of you if you want to 
completely identify with that and believe it and say, I was born again. We were all born again. There, there's a whole new fantastic hope because of what Jesus did there and what he suffered. What he suffered was, was like the travail of childbirth and joy has been born into this world. And that joy belongs to me and no one can take that away. That's what Jesus is encouraging his disciples to understand. You can enter in alongside that joy and you can live it the rest of your life. This is an eternal birth. This is something that belongs to you. He says now in verse 23, and in that day, you will ask me no question. Truly, truly, I say to you, if you ask the Father for anything, he will give it to you in my name. He says, what you've seen in my intimate connection with the Father, because that's the glory that we beheld. If we'd been there to, to physically walk with Jesus and spend time, John says the glory we beheld when God became a man and walked with us, the glory we beheld wasn't like a, a searchlight, something like, wow, that's bright, that's glorious. He says the glory we beheld was like the glory of an intimate friendship between a father and his only child. And that loving bond they had witnessed that for years. Jesus was never alone. He, he would always had the Father with him. He always had this sense, even though nobody seemed to get it, nobody seemed to understand, the people he loved the most seemed to be so against him and, and opposed to him. But he always took refuge in his relationship with the Father. He's saying, folks, when I leave, I'm now enabling you through my spirit to come inside of you, you have that same relationship with the Father. You can talk to Him. You can take comfort in His presence. You're not approaching Him like, oh, you're the holy God and I'm an unworthy servant here. You can come like a, like a son, like a child, a beloved child. You can intimately talk to God. You can intimately talk to Him as though He's your Father, the most wonderfully loving friend and Father you can imagine. You have that now. You're not going to be asking in a formal way, trying to go through the, the, the people who have connections. You've got that intimate connection. And he says, verse 24, Until now you have asked for nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive that your joy can be made full. He says, up till now, you know, their relationship with the Father was, was pretty formal. You know, he gave them the prayer, Father, feed us, forgive us, deliver us. He, he taught them to address God as their father. But until that spirit of family would come inside of them later, uh, it's hard to, to grasp it. It's hard to enter into that. But he says, up till now, you, you, you've not approached, but in the future, you can. And you can ask for things in my name, and he will give that which you ask for in my name, that your joy would be made full. Now, if, if you've been around churches and church people and, and those who read the Bible and then those who tell you what they think about it, especially the preacher kind, you've, you've probably heard some crazy things. Certainly I have. And I believe some crazy things. I've probably said some crazy things. But uh, that's just because I'm crazy. <laughs> We're all crazy in some way or another. But, but God's word is, is safe and sure and true. And those who would, who would abuse the Bible in any way, misinterpret it, whether they, whether they mean it maliciously or not, if they abuse the Bible, they, they only abuse themselves. And, and maybe the people who have to listen to them or choose to listen to them. But, but what God says is, is true and sure. And I've heard these words, these precious words abused so many times. Uh, making prayer, making talking to God as though it were... Uh, the approach of a sorcerer to some source of power, as though, as though prayer were, were magic, some magic powers, and you say it in Jesus' name, like you rub the lamp, and I want this in Jesus' name, and now you, you get it. it. It doesn't work like that. God's too good. And what a world is... We, he's too good to give us that kind of power to destroy and to harm. Prayer is, is in fact an interface with the Father. It's a personal interface with somebody who loves you and cares for you. And the greatest blessing of prayer is to know that you're loved and cared for, that you're right in the presence of your Father. 
And though you might not even be able to come up with the words, the magic words or even the words that make sense for your situation, the Spirit will help you, even with groanings too deep for words, because He knows and He understands. And it's that personal interface that, that can't be abused, because He's the face on the other side. He is the Father. You may get confused and you may have all these, I want this and I want that, but don't worry, He won't give it to you. Coming in Jesus' name is not just like, oh, I come. in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, that's the power word, that's the power phrase. It doesn't work that way. It has to be in Jesus' nature. It has to be in, in alignment with who Jesus is. You, you come as Jesus would come. And that's for your protection and for your joy, always for your joy. You know, we can be foolish, but you can't fool the Father. And he won't stop loving you. He won't stop caring for you. When you, when you come to him, when you have that interface, when you have that invitation in prayer, it's a great privilege. And don't worry, you, you, you can't mess things up because you prayed the wrong way. But if you come in the right way, you'll, you'll know that you are loved and that you're cared for because that's what it's all about, that personal interface. I, I was talking to a young father Oh, two weeks ago, and um, his young father, he, he just turned 40, but to me, he's a kid, and, and he's got a couple of, of little kids, and, and we were out, um, he's got some farm property, and, and so they invited a few of, of us, some younger families, and I came because my grandkids were invited, and we're out there, and they've got all these apple trees and pear trees, and, and um, you know, it's a phrase we've often used in our family. Again, it's, it's one you've heard that the apple doesn't far, fall far from the tree. You know, the, the idea in which you see certain traits in your kids or grandkids, like, I know where that came from. You know, it's like the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. You're just like that. Well, we, it was funny because we were out there picking apples and seeing the apples on the ground. And, and I see my grandkids acting so much like my son. He's there and they act like me. And I'm sorry for that. But we've got, you know, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And we're watching this. And this fella is there. And, and um, he's got a... a techie background, a Silicon Valley sort of background, but now he, for, for, for family and for pleasure, he's got this farm and he's working with all of this stuff, and he's got these little, these little kids, and um, one of them, I don't, I don't know, three years old maybe, just a little bitty guy, and he, he knew, even though these are like farm kids and they're not afraid of anything, they're just out there wandering around all this acreage and being farm kids, they're also kind of techie kids too. And this one little one, you know, I, I don't know what he's going to be, you know, tech-wise later, but again, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. His dad had a background in that. So he's, the, the dad is telling me how he, he, got, he got his dad's phone. And other people, some of the people there at the thing were going, yeah, I got a text from him. I got, you know, all this little kid that can't even write, but they get messages from this kid. Well, how does he get into the phone? Well, there's face recognition on this phone. And the kid has, has realized that if I just show the phone to dad and he's not paying attention, I've got his face and now I've opened it up and now I can start. <laughs> I've, I've got access. And so this young dad was talking about, you know, the kids of the future. What are they going to do? You're sitting there sleeping and they come up and they put the phone over your face and now... Now you've got the interface, and now you've got the access, and whoo, isn't that scary, you know, the world wide web. But with our Heavenly Father, that interface we have with Him, you, you, can, you can be foolish, but you can't fool Him. You can't come in and, I've got access to the world, all this power, all this sort of stuff. No, He puts safety locks. He puts safeguards. Number one, you have to come in Jesus' name. If you don't come with the humility and patience and kindness and nature of Jesus, don't worry, your prayers won't be answered. Because <laughs> what you want isn't good for you, it's not good for anyone else. That's not the purpose. You come in Jesus' name, you come his, in his nature. And then the second safeguard is that your joy may be made full. If you're asking for something that would not bring you joy, that would just, then you're just talking. You're talking and you may be doing it in a religious way, but if you really want the interface, you come in the spirit of Jesus and you come to a father who loves you and you know you're not alone and you can talk and take comfort and be encouraged and you still don't know the future, but you know, I'll be all right. I don't have to know the future. I don't know, I don't have to know what's going to come with this next test result or with this next interview or with this next 
whatever's coming. All I know is that I'm loved and I'm cared for and it goes on forever. No one can take this family, this relationship, this joy away. And that's what Jesus is wanting us all to see and to know. He says in the future, it's not gonna be like going through the steps and approaching. You're gonna talk to the Father directly yourself. Until now, you've asked for nothing in my name. Ask, and you'll receive so that your joy may be made full. These things I've spoken to you in figurative language. But an hour is coming when I will speak no more to you in figurative language, but I will tell you plainly of the Father. In that day, you will ask in my name. And I'm not saying to you that I will request the Father on your behalf. For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and you've believed that I came forth from the Father. So he's saying, when I come back and announce that I'm risen, it's not just my victory, I'm going to my Father and your Father. I'm going to my God and your God. We, we are now family and I'm not gonna have to intercede for you. You don't even need a whole bunch of patron saints to intercede. You are loved and because of that loving bond, because of that family connection that can't be taken away, he says, you, you can take your comfort there. The Father himself loves you because you have loved me. This is a connection that can't be hacked. It's one that, that can't be harmed by others. And, and thankfully, I can't even harm myself through these powers. I can harm myself through my unbelief. I can harm myself by, by trying to twist it to my own hurt. But in terms of the connection, you know, nowadays, of course, it's, it's not, it's not um, high tech, but for, for a while now, we've had uh, some pretty high voltage lines coming into our house. We have places you can plug in and, you know, uh, doesn't take a genius to, to realize when your little toddlers come into the world, you, maybe you better do something about those plugs, but child protective things, but you know, it's like this, it's not like, okay, we're gonna go off grid because we just had a child. We just, no, we're gonna keep the power in the house. We're just gonna put some safeguards on so that the child doesn't fry themselves. <laughs> One day they'll learn how to do it right, but until they do, well, if, if we're smart enough to do that for our kids, how much more our Heavenly Father? He's put safeguards in there. I don't have to worry about not having enough power or that the power is going to you know, hex me because I prayed the wrong thing. I can just interface with the Father, come in the name of Jesus, know that I am loved, know that I love Jesus because he's the one who made it all possible that we be part of this forever family. And so he says that's the way the relationship's going to be going forward. This, this connection can't be hacked. You can't be harmed. There's safeguards on either side to protect you. You're loved. He says in verse 28, I came forth from the Father, and I've come into the world. I'm leaving the world again, and I'm going to the Father. You know, pretty straightforward. I'm not sure that, that it's understood, but he says, I came forth from the Father, not even I was sent forth. He's, he's not presenting himself as the pawn in anyone else's game. I came, I chose. I came forth from the Father. I've come into the world. I am leaving the world again. You know, like he would say later, no one takes my life away. Die on the cross, but no. This is my departure, the way it needs to be. I'm leaving the world again, and I'm going to the Father. And so his disciples said, Lo, lo, now you are speaking plainly. And you're not using a figure of speech. Now we know that you know all things. And you have no need for anyone to question you. By this we believe that you came from God. <laughs> These guys are so funny. They, they, in fact, you know, when little kids really think they're grown up and adult, that's kind of when they're the funniest sometimes. You don't get mad at them. You're just kind of like, okay. <laughs> you're playing dress up. You think you know now. It's like, you know, you're still, you're cute. <laughs> but you just don't know how much you don't know. There's so much power in knowing what you don't know. And, and, and then so much more power in trusting the one who does know. He's your father. And just hoping in him 
But at this point, they're thinking, oh, now we know. Now we know that you know all things, you know. Watch out, whenever you get to that now I know point, <laughs> think again. Now we know that you know all things and you have no need for anyone to question you. It almost sounds like they thought they were doing Jesus a favor when they questioned him. Now you might be doing me a big favor when you question me. Do you know what you're doing? No, I'm not sure. You know, it's funny, my wife and I driving around together and, and uh, you know, that's, that's two heads and four eyes all watching the road because we're sitting in the same car. And when we were younger and less mature, especially on my part, you know, you could get on this, hey, well, you know, look, at I, don't tell me, you know, and all that sort of stuff. Thankfully, in our journey, actually, we're growing up and maturing. Not everyone does, but you can, to where you realize that, look, you know, it's not like, quit telling me. It's every time she tries to correct me every time she tells me, watch out for this, look out for that. Did you want to turn here? Did you want to turn there? Even, even if it, in my mind, it's very obvious, of course. Even if it feels like, duh, I, I don't do that because I realize the truth. That she's not trying to boss me and tell me, she's trying to help me. So I, always, I just try to make it a habit and not just a habit of mouth. I try to hold it in my heart. Thank you, thank you. Oh yeah, yeah, thanks, I, 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 I saw that, that oh yeah. And then with the knowledge that, boy, sometimes <laughs> what she reminded me of saved me. It's like, okay, I we would have got creamed, if, or I would have, you know. I can't talk like this. It's a good thing I'm not driving right now, because <laughs> I can either drive, and I can listen to things, but I, I, can't, I can't talk and drive real well, because I'll just go into autopilot, and I'll go right past, I'll, I'll go to the most familiar place I normally would, and then drive right past where I intended to go. So thankfully, we, you know, we, we're, we're in this together, not to, in it together to fight, but in it together to help each other. That's a metaphor for life. Growing up, we're, we're here to help each other, not to fight. Thank God you've got a different perspective. Thank God that you've got a whole different way of looking at it. Maybe you belong to a different party or a different nation or even a different religion. But, but the fact is, is that you're not my enemy. And if you want to be my friend, I'd like to be your, I'd like to learn how we can talk and see and work together. And, and so this whole idea of, of you don't need to be questioned, Jesus. In the case, in the, in the only the case of Jesus, he never needed to be questioned, <laughs> okay? There's one man, you don't need to question him. He always knows what he's doing. And his disciples think, now we know. You know, we don't need to help you anymore, Jesus. Now we know you have no need for anyone to question you. He said, by this we believe that you came from God. Now, Okay, that's true enough. He did come from God, just like he very clearly said in that previous verse. But the stumbling block wasn't that he come from God. The stumbling block was he was about to leave. He was about to go. All of them were going to fall apart pretty quickly over that. And he's trying to prepare them for that fact. It's not, guys, really believe me. Really believe me. Give me credit. I came from God. It's, guys, you really need to understand. I'm going. I'm leaving. But it's, it's to your advantage. It's to your benefit. That's what he's trying to help them with. But they think, aha, now, now we know. Now we've got it. You came from God. And Jesus answered them, do you now believe? Do you now believe? Now we know. Great. But do you believe? Do you believe? Trust God. Trust Jesus. Don't trust yourself. I mean, to some extent, but in the end, I, I could be wrong. There's so many things I could be wrong about. Okay, it's fine. Find out I'm wrong, good. That's the first step toward being right on something. But do trust Jesus and do trust God. Jesus said, so now you know. Okay. But even if you know, a more important question is do you believe? It's not about how much you know. Getting into heaven, not, not when you die, but getting heaven into you right now while you live. Getting into heaven isn't an entrance exam. It's not all that you know. It only gets into you so far as you believe it. Now, I'm a pretty skeptical person. There's a lot of stuff I just don't believe. Maybe true, maybe not, I don't know. What Jesus says, I want to believe. I want to believe it hook, line, and sinker. I, I want to. And I find that he's believing. Jesus is saying, you say you know, 
Do you believe? It's not enough to have knowledge. It's not enough to have. You have to hold. And to hold it, that's where faith comes in. You know, we sang earlier from Psalm 63. I, 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 that line that I put in there about, I will, I will cling to the mighty hand that holds our family. He holds the whole family. The whole world is in his hand, as we say, or as we sang as kids. He holds, I don't hold it together, but I cling to the hand that holds my family. Rather than me stress out that my family's people are sick and people are crazy and people are falling apart, and th there is one who holds it, and I cling to the hand that holds it. To have and to hold, we have so much more than we can imagine. But do we hold it? Do we believe it? Is it something we're enjoying? That's, that's the, the great question. He says, you know, but do you believe? The truth will set you free, Jesus said. And it will. But not just because you have it in your Bible or even because you have it in your brain. It's, it's not the truth that you have that sets you free. It's the truth that you hold. It's not the fact, even if you've got all the best doctrine and you really are right, more right than anyone else you know. To, to have it, to know the truth is not what sets you free. It's to believe the truth. To believe it. To enjoy it. Again, that table set before you, there it all is. But you know what? You, you're not going to get any enjoyment and you won't get any calories either until you take it in. You, you just enjoy it. And that's, that's the necessity of life. That's the invitation of life. That's why we're told that man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's why we're told we have to live by faith and not by sight. Sight is a way in which we, through our eyes or through the, our mind's eye, we acquire things. I know it. I know it. I saw it. I know it. I read it. I know it. But that is not the way we live. We live by believing the true things that Jesus says, by believing. It's not enough to have the, the, the means for life. We spend so much trying to accumulate enough to retire and to get everything all lined up and to have the means. But the means for life without having a meaning for living, that's, that's why so many are in despair. It's not, it's not the means for life, it's what's the meaning of life? Why am I here? Okay, so I'm retired and I don't have to work so hard. So what? The only thing that has meaning to me, and Jesus makes it clear, it's relationships. It's people. It's love. It's something that comes forth from the Father and will enable us to love in a similar way. That's what we're here for. That's the meaning of life. Man cannot live by bread alone. But, but by the love, loving your neighbor, loving even your enemy, a, a work that God is working on. That's the, that's the great work. You know, huh? Do you now believe? Behold, an hour is coming and has already come for you to be scattered, each to his own home, and to leave me alone. He says that time is coming. And I underlined a couple of words there for myself. I'll share them with you. It's the word scattered. And then those words, each to his own, or to each his own. That's ultimately what scattered means. Scattered because to each his own. Now a lot of times in my mind with the arguments or things I don't understand, that's the way I, I put a philosophical end to my argument or to my mental anguish. I just kind of say, oh well, to each his own. <laughs> go figure, takes, you know, it takes, a, it takes all kinds for the world to go around. Sometimes I say it with a, with a snarkiness, you know, to each his own, like you idiot, <laughs> to each his own. Because I know my own is the best own. <laughs> but that's what scattered is all about. We each go to our own. And then we defend our own, we arm our own, we put walls around our own, and we all, you know, this is my heaven. Uh, that, that's ultimately hell. Isolation, loneliness, my perspective, my way or the highway. God, God's at work doing something just the opposite. Scattered to each his own. That's sometimes the best we can do. Oh well, to each his own. I'm not going to fret about it. I'm not going to 
worry about it. I'm not going to hang around and send you one more email to try and make you see what, you know what, you may be wrong. I think that you're wrong, but it's all right. That's, for now, that's sometimes the best we can do. Be at peace. And so far as it's possible, be at peace with all men. But here's the encouraging thing. Maybe that's the best we can do, but God can do better. And that's exactly what Jesus is doing. He's doing something so much better. He has a plan for the ages. We'll get into it next week with chapter 17. But let me just read to you. Listen. You can go look at it later yourself. But this is Ephesians chapter 1. What do you know? What do you know? Listen to this for a second. In all wisdom and insight, God has made known to us the mystery of his will. Okay, whether you know it or not, this is what you know. God, in all wisdom and insight, God has made known to us the mystery of his will. You know, in so many ways, God moves in mysterious ways. I can't figure out why this happened to you and that happened to me. You got on the train, I got on the plane, this crashed. And all of that is mysterious, but you know what? The, the real mystery of his will, God has made it known. It's a will that works according to his good pleasure, to his kind intention. God's will is good. His good pleasure, his intention is kind. And it's a will that was explained in Jesus. And it's a will regarding God's plan for the fullness of all of the ages. And what is that plan? It's a plan to bring all things together again in Christ. Things in the heavens and things on the earth. If that sounds too good to be true, you're right, it's good. But the, the best things can only be true because God is the best. That's the plan. The plan is not, okay, a little more scattering, a little more to each his own. Let's make some coalitions and alliances with the ones who are closest to us so that we can fight the folks over there. It goes on and on and on. That's the world. Lust, lust, boast. But what Jesus began when humanity was born again through his suffering was to begin a, a, a new humanity. And if, and if we call ourselves Christians, if we like that idea, I like the idea. It's, it simply means that. I, I'm on board for, for something that God himself will complete. I can only be a part of it for a while. I'll only see in a limited sense. But one day we'll all see. That's the plan. So for right now, Jesus says, an hour is coming, has already come. You will be scattered, each to his own. Leave me alone. You will leave me alone. But he says, and yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. Isn't that? I'm not alone. Jesus doesn't say, you guys are going to leave me. You all said, you promised. You're, all, you're not promise keepers. You're promise breakers. You left me in my hour of need. <laughs> he said, you're going to each go to your own your own comfort place. Everyone goes to their own, this is my happy place, this is my protected place, this is my familiar place. It may be pretty neurotic, it may have all kinds of barbs aimed out at others, but that's what we tend to do. You're all gonna do that tonight. You'll be scattered. Everyone will feel at home because I got my own little thing. Stay away because I'm, don't mess with my happy place. But you're scattered as a result. He says, you're gonna leave me alone, but you know what, I'm not alone. I've got the Father. You know what? If you got the father, you got the family. And he's going to put it all back together again. You just have to believe that and live in accordance with that. And not, you can be patient because you know that God is powerful. You can realize that if I don't see it with my own eyes one day, like Job says, I will see with my own eyes. My Redeemer lives, and he's your Redeemer, and he's the Redeemer of, of, of all this crazy world. And so he, he, he says, I'm not alone. The Father is with me. And with everything else we've talked about here that he's shown us here today, the point of that is not just the Father is with me, not with you. It's from here on out, the Father is with you in that same way. You have that refuge. You're, you're not alone. He says, these things I've spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you'll have trouble. But cheer up. Take courage. I've overcome the world. 
You know, Jesus keeps all of his promises, every one of them. He said, in the world you'll have trouble. Amen? Kept that promise. And yet he said, don't worry about it. Each day has enough trouble of its own. But if that part is true, then I would really pray that we can believe the rest of what he said. Cheer up. You got enough trouble for today. And who knows what trouble will come tomorrow. Don't worry. It'll, you'll see it when you get there. But cheer up. Why? I've overcome this whole world. Not I played the game, less, less, boast, better than anyone else. I overcame the game because I, 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 I let the, the prince of this world do the worst to me. And I defeated him. And I came back not just to say, I won. I came back to say, we've all won, if you want it. If you want to believe it, if you want to enter it, if you want to identify yourself with that, once for all, we were born again in Christ. Once for all. And now God works all things together for good. To those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Everything. He's, he's working it together for good. So rejoice. Again, I say, rejoice. Always. Thankful. Always. I feel a, a song in my heart. So Sonia, let's, let's, let, we're going to do a song from up here. And you may or may not want to turn the camera. It's up to you. You've already done so much here today. But uh, let's, let's close with the song. <laughs> Thank you.